letter F. Letter F. Reminding us of that day when Jesus comes back. Caught up together. There soon will come a day in life, though no man knoweth when, that Christ our Lord and Master will come back to earth again. The Bible tells us how the dead in Christ shall rise that day. Then with the mighty glorious host my soul shall fly away. We're going to be caught up together on that resurrection day. Shout hallelujah as we leave this world to stay. Oh Christian, then be ready for that blessed morning fair when we shall be caught up together to meet our Lord in the air. When Jesus comes that final morn, we'll hear the trumpet blast. Sweet music to the Christians here, we'll know he's come at last. Don't look for me, I'll not be found, I'm going up with him. I'll take my trip on Zion ship to heaven's pure sailing. We're going to be caught up together on that resurrection day. Shout hallelujah as we leave this world to stay. Oh, Christian, then be ready for that blessed morning fair when we should be caught up together to meet our Lord in the air. Oh, Christian, then be ready for that blessed morning fair when we should be caught up together to meet our Lord in the air. All right, stay up here. Back. All right, come on up here, Elijah. All right, we're going to sing one of these songs out of the hymn book. That is a precious song. If you want to sing along, you can. Number 110. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. And that's letter A. Letter A. We're going to skip the chorus after the second, third, and fourth. Or after the second and third. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious, oh, how blessed to call him mine. Oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to me. Lord. 
your testimony today, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. And if that's the case, you'll really like what we're going to talk about today. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. If you can't get enough of Jesus, then good news, there's going to be a place where he's going to be all in all, all the time. And we're going to talk about that today as we look at Revelation 21. There was a man, it's told, who lived in a big house. And the man who lived in the big house with gold and silver and precious stones all over the place could not enjoy the beauty of the gold and silver and precious stones all over the place. I might say if I was Elijah, then that's a riddle. Why is it he could not enjoy it? And the answer to that riddle is because he was blind. You know, as we think about heaven with all of its beauties, and we're going to look at some of those today, we realize that we could not enjoy the beauties of heaven except the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb was the light thereof. Eternity can only be enjoyed in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that as we look at our text today. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. We'll begin at verse number 9 of Revelation chapter 21. John here narrating. says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. It had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the walls thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length of it is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, an hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like in the clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, Chalcedony, the fourth, an emerald, the fifth, Sardox, the sixth, Sardius, the seventh, Crystallite, the eighth, Beryl, the ninth, Topaz, the tenth, a Christorus, the eleventh, a Jason, and the twelfth, an Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us today as we look at this passage of Scripture. Help us to see that at the center of eternity, at the center of heaven is your glory. And that which glorifies you the most is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Encourage us today. Help this preacher. Guided by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
You can be seated. In verses 9 and 10, we see that John was able to take a closer look at the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is uh, called the, the bride, the lamb's wife. And typically in the other parts of the scripture, when we talk about the lamb's wife or the bride, we're talking about the church. But here we're talking about the eternal dwelling place of the church, the New Jerusalem. So the angel takes John and says, uh, you know, let's go up uh, to this great high mountain. And of course, this uh, New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high. You know, if you want to think about something that uh, probably is, is pretty meaningless, you know, some people believe that the New Jerusalem is a, is a cube. Some people believe it's a pyramid. So, you know, that's just kind of a little bit of trivia you can think on when you don't have anything else to think about. But in any case, it's humongous. 1,500 miles, that's, what, here to halfway across the country. And uh, so it was this big, high, tall mountain. And uh, John and this angel are going to examine. You can imagine how tall a mountain is if a city is that size. But that's another thing you can think about. But as John looks at the New Jerusalem, and that is the place where we, as God's children, are going to live for eternity, what's the first thing he notices in verse number 11? It says, having the glory of God. The first thing John notices is the glorious brightness of the New Jerusalem. Uh, this brightness is, is similar to that brightness that was in the tabernacle in the wilderness, similar to the brightness that was in the temple in Jerusalem. And that is, this is the visible presence of God. You know, over and over again as you read this, they call it the Shekinah glory. And so we see, that's the first thing he notices, is the brightness of the city, the glory of God. And it says here, and her light was likened to a stone most precious. In other words, a, a jewel stone that was of the richest or most costly uh, nature. You know, what is this stone that is the glory of God that is so precious? Let's see if we can compare Scripture with Scripture. Let's go back to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. See if we can identify the stone today that brightens up all of glory. Matthew 21, verses 42 through 45. It says here, Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures, and this is from Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, this, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now, what is the stone being spoken of by Jesus in the scripture? The stone is none other than Jesus himself. And uh, this is the cornerstone. And he's saying here that if you, the Jewish nation, reject this stone, reject me, then I am going to be given to another nation, the Gentiles, who will bring forth fruits, who will receive me, and glorify me. And if you fall on this stone, you will be broken. You will be destroyed. And whomever the stone falls on, it says here, will be ground to powder. And so you don't mess with this stone, okay? You embrace, you receive the stone. You make him the chief cornerstone, which means you make him that which, by which you line up your life. And this stone is the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in Acts chapter 4, 
Acts chapter 4. We see the Apostle Peter here in Acts chapter 4. And he's speaking here, beginning of verse number 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, if you remember in, uh, verse number, in chapter number 3, the little song we sing with the kids sometimes, Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man, by the way. He asked for alms and held out his palms, and this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Well, the thing that bothered him wasn't the fact that this lame man was walking, but what bothered him was he healed this lame man in whose name? In the name of Jesus. That's right. And so... Uh, you know, how is this man made whole? Peter asked, in verse number 9 of chapter 4. It said, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Verse 11. Echoing Jesus' words. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Who is the stone that was set aside by the Jewish nation? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the stone. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, precious. Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, he that believeth on him, on the stone, shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So as we go back to our text in Revelation 21, Verse 11, having the glory of God, her light was likened to a stone most precious. What is the source of this light? What is the ultimate glory of God? The person of the Lord Jesus Christ is lighting up the new Jerusalem. It says that he is even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. I don't know much about my stones. Uh, they said that jasper typically is like a, like a soft green oriental jasper in that day. But then it also comes in different shades and different colors. And so as we think about this jasper stone, it, it, it's, a, it's a precious stone. It's a pure stone. It is glorious to the eye. You know, there's some things that just are pleasing to the eyes. You know, I was watching uh, one uh, preacher on YouTube uh, before we got our, you know, camera here. And I was just amazed because behind him, there was this blue light. And you'll see that a lot of times in worship videos, these blue lights. And you, you know, and you just, it almost draws you in, this blue light. It's just such a beautiful light. 
You think about the colors of the earth, the greens that are about to break forth, you know, because of spring, and the blue sky, and sometimes you look up at that sky, and you just want to stare at it. It's so, so beautiful. That's what is meant by a jasper stone. It's that if you shine a light through the stone, it's a color that is just pleasant and beautiful and pure and glorious. And so Philip Dotteridge says this, thinking about the New Jerusalem, where Christians are going to live for all of eternity. The whole city, as it was represented as a pendant in the air, shone with an elegant and amazing luster. Think about a beautiful stone, a beautiful jewel. And I don't get into that like some people do. Um, but just think about a beautiful jewel hanging in the air or resting upon the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the picture of the new Jerusalem. The abode of the saved. And you think about what is it giving off this light which makes this place, the New Jerusalem, so attractive. And it's not a what, but it's a who. And that is the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. We think about the road to Damascus. And who was on the road to Damascus? A guy named Saul, a very evil guy, persecuting the church. And he looked on that light, and he was blinded. And eventually, you know, uh, Ananias came and, you know, he was, uh, he was healed of that blindness. But you think about that light, you know, the sun. It's said that there were a couple of, I don't know if they were sisters or who, in the past in my mom's family. And they had a contest, who could look at the sun the longest. <laughs> and they went blind. You know, I mean, these are some crazy times. People come up with crazy games. I tell my kids, don't play that game, okay? But the sun, it would be beautiful to look upon the sun, that ball in the sky, with all of its fiery splendor. But we can't do that now. But you know what? There's coming a day when to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory, it won't be blinding because of our sinful state, but we'll get to take it in and we'll get to enjoy it in the New Jerusalem. It's a wonderful thought. Today it says we see through a glass darkly. But one day we will see him what? Face to face. What a wonderful prospect. Well verses uh, 12 through 21. You can read that if you want. And you can go and you can meditate on all these beauties in heaven. We see uh, it has a tall jasper wall. With 12 gates. The 12 gates are made of pearl. It comes right from the Bible. People talk about the pearly gates. Well, this is it. Peter is not standing by the pearly gates, okay? Uh, that's, 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 that's a fiction. That's a lie. He does not let you into heaven, okay? You don't have to explain yourself to Peter. That's a, that's a, uh, a lie that comes from you know, Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, but there are 12 gates, each made of a pearl. Twelve sparkling foundations, each made of precious stones. Now the names of the gates are the twelve tribes of Israel. The names on those precious stones are the twelve apostles. And so we see here living in one new Jerusalem is both the Old Testament and the New Testament saints in this one city. I mentioned before that this city is 1,500 miles long, wide, and tall. Inside the city, it's pure gold, like in the clear glass. But as we think about the gates of pearl, we think about the street of gold, we think about the walls, the foundations, you know, we're kind of like that man in the house that was so fancy who was blind. 
if we don't have the light to show it to us. And who is that light? The Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, there's no heaven without Jesus. And I'm telling you that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, even if you were able to go to heaven, you would not enjoy it. It would be a miserable place. You know, if you think that preaching of the Bible is miserable, and you think that hearing people talk about Jesus is miserable here on earth, in heaven, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> he is the light. He gets into every nook and cranny of that city. And he shines throughout the entire new heavens and new earth. There's no night there. There's no weariness there. It's Jesus 24-7 all the time. And if you, you can't stand church, if you can't stand it when someone talks about Jesus or the Bible, then heaven would be a hell to you. And of course, hell, the lake of fire, is no great place. But if you're not in love with Jesus here on earth, and you don't like to spend time with Jesus here on earth, then you know what? Heaven is going to be a miserable place. And you're not going there. Because it's all about Jesus. And even all of these great things we read about, they're only great because the light is reflecting off of them from the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if I can make that any plainer. The street of gold isn't the amazing thing. The wall, the, the, the gates of pearl, you know, the, the foundations. They're nothing without the light shining upon them so that you can see them and enjoy them. Heaven is all about God's glory. And the thing which glorified God the most is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, verse number 22 and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Old Jerusalem. You know, there's a contrast here between Old Jerusalem and New Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem by John and by the Jewish people was seen as a special city, a holy city. But in, in Old Jerusalem, there's one building that stood out above all the others. What was that building? The temple. The temple. I like to see these paintings of, of old villages and towns in America. And arising above that little village wasn't a skyscraper back in the early days. Uh, it wasn't some big mansion. But what was it in these early towns and villages and cities that rose above everything else? The church steeples. That's right. You look at, uh, I look at the, uh, the ruins of Richmond after the Civil War. And there they are, the church steeples, standing out <laughs> there in Richmond. So in old Jerusalem, the temple stood out. What is the temple? What is the church? What are we doing here? We need to ask ourselves that question every once in a while. What am I doing here? Well, the temple was a place where God's people could come apart from the world and worship God. That's what we're doing here today. You know, I believe we ought to get out in the world. Jesus says we're to be in the world, but not of the world. We need to be salt. We need to be light in this world. But we also need those times where the walls of this church put the world outside. And we come together as God's people and assemble with one mind and one spirit to worship him and to hear from him. And that place where people can come apart from the world and worship God, that place doesn't exist in heaven. Why is that? Think about it. Be a philosopher for a minute. Think about it. It's because God is everywhere. <laughs> There's no world out there. No sinful, 
discouraging, dysfunctional world out there anymore. It's all the glory of God. It's all the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of that place. There's no need of a temple. There's no need of baptism any longer. There's no need of the Lord's Supper any longer, the ordinances. Why is that? You know, I think that's a very important thing. The ordinances of the church. And I remember growing up, I grew up in a church that preached a different gospel. But every week they'd have the Lord's Supper. And I was reminded every week in that divine picture that Jesus died. And he had to die for some reason. And I figured it out as a little kid. He died for my sins, according to the scripture. And I was reminded as we took the Lord's Supper that he's no longer dead. But that he rose from the dead. And if you read 1 Corinthians 11, it says he's, he's coming again. Do this until he comes again. You're reminded of Jesus. You know, when you're baptized. Or when you see someone being baptized. You're reminded that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again according to the scripture. And that that act that Jesus did is what saves us. But you know what in heaven? There's no need for a meeting place. The whole world will be our meeting place. There's no need for ordinances. Why do you need pictures when you have the real thing? That's why the Old Testament sacrifices are done away with. Someone was saying, I forget who it was, said it's a good thing, you know, because if I was an Old Testament preacher, <laughs> I'd have blood all over me, <laughs> killing all them animals all the time, preaching with blood on my hands, you know. I mean, you imagine that. They're done away with. Why? Because they're fulfilled. Jesus has come. Jesus has died. You know, prayer. That song we sing, Sweet Hour of Prayer, that last verse says, Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. You mean there won't be any praying in heaven? Well, they'll be talking to God in heaven. But there's no need to pray because we'll be there in his midst, his glory filling the place. Just some amazing stuff to try to wrap around your head. It says, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. You see, the God of this world is Satan. Sin and darkness characterize this world we live in. Therefore, we need the church as a place.